But I always wondered, like, what do people think of us? You know, our history is different. Um, I remember asking a guy at the Animal Preserve, like, what do you think of, you know, African-Americans that come back here? I know our history is different, but do you think that this is something that they would um, see as a negative? You know, what do you think? And their answer was so beautiful. He was like, we see it. We we are so happy for you to come back to the continent of Africa and see like, this is your home. Like this is a place where you are, you know, you're a part of this, this, this place and you should welcome it. And it just made me feel so loved, you know? No, let's not, let's, let's like, go no. there. So like a really bad mom who quote unquote, I'm tired of people in my race. So I need to find me somebody white. This is how I knew that <laughs> Brian Don't do it. was gonna be Don't a go great, there physical partner. <laughs> Don't tell that. Hey everyone, welcome to the Let's Get Deep podcast where we have conversations about our lives that most people would never. Would never. We uh, just posted last week about our hike on Mount Kilimanjaro, which was an entire journey in and of itself. To say all of that, it was an hour and 15 minutes cut down. So we could not talk about anything else but that. And I, and I told Lexi, I was like, hey, let's just make this one like, we'll try to do like 45 minutes. Cut down was an hour 15. It was That's too how deep. intense it was. It was too deep. <laughs> but today we are going to try to do a shorter podcast. But today uh, we want to just talk about the experience overall of Africa. Like y'all. This was Lexi's first time going to Africa. The continent of Africa. Y'all, I know Africa is a continent uh, for those that question it. But we went to Tanzania. But this was my first time in the continent of Africa, which I think sometimes it gets uh, confused because black people who are here, they see that as very special. We see that as very special um, because... There was a whole history that I feel like was taken away from us. And for us to go back to, you know, the continent, I feel was very special and also curious and wondering, like, you know, how are people going to accept me? How do people feel about black Americans and all this type of stuff? So it was interesting. And I think it would be a really interesting conversation to bring all of you into, because a lot of our community, we have a lot of people from Africa in our community. So I think the conversation that we have would be interesting to see you know, what that dynamic is between like African Americans and Africa, you know? I feel like how we, at least I will say my family, because I talk to my family and I also talk to my friends. Um, I know people that went to uh, different parts of Africa. I think a few of my friends went to Kenya, um, some went to Nigeria, and it was such a beautiful experience for them to see like people just feeling welcomed and them reminding you that this is your like homeland. Like this is where you're from and you should come back here more and all of these things. And I always was curious, like what that meant for me, like when I went and when I tell you going to Tanzania, the people there were so loving, so caring. Um, So many people reminded was just telling me like, Oh my gosh, I just, you need to come back here. This is your homeland and all of that. It was beautiful. Yeah. But I have questions before we get to that point. So Okay. Um, my question is, do you feel like... I know there was a lot going on with the getting prepared for Kilimanjaro part. Mm-hmm. But did you take time prior to leaving to like really let it soak in and sit with you like I'm about to go back? Because... One thing that we realized was that you're actually the first person on your mother's side that has gone back to Africa. Yeah. And they saw that as such a big thing. Like I was. I think it is. Yeah. They were like, I mean, my mom was just like, are you kind of like asking the same question? Like, are you taking in that you're about to go to the continent of Africa? Like, are you, you know, like we've never been. And, you know, it's just a huge stepping moment, you know. Yeah. And. I would say I didn't really think about it because I was so nervous about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Y'all, if y'all haven't, check out the check out the podcast. But I was so nervous about that that I didn't take it in until I got on the plane, which thank God, in a sense, thank God, the plane ride was like what? Long. It was long. It was like twenty hours. We had three plane rides Mm. to get there. It was like two hours, eight hours, eight hours. And it felt like I had time to just like take it in feel the moment, be present. So when I got off the plane, I was like, 
oh my goodness, I am really here. I've been to so many different countries and I've been to different continents and I just didn't, to be in that moment, I felt really good. I remember we were, um, because you know, you're like, when you get the plane lands, you're like gathering all your stuff. It's like a little frenzy and everything. So I remember um, for this plane at Kilimanjaro, when we arrived, we were like not going into a gate. We were going onto the ground yeah. you know, from the stairs. So I remember like getting on the stairs. All of a sudden I looked at you. You were in front of me. I was like, oh my God, I need to record this moment. <laughs> like, I was like fumbling with my pants trying to find my it phone. It was a like, big moment. Get it, get it, get it, get it. it was a big moment. I was just like, oh my goodness. Like I'm, I'm here. I'm coming. I'm coming to this to this place that I've always wanted to go to. And I wanted to go to Kenya Mm. last year and i couldn't yeah. because i was pregnant and i was so discouraged about that youtube was about to fly us out to kenya to a beautiful resort for like a program we were in and we were like we're giving up a free trip to kenya for elijah he was worth it but we lord love, love i was you, so elijah. mad i was so disappointed so this was just redemptive for me to mm. go and I feel like a lot of people do question, like, what do people think when you go back? You know, how we feel is going back. Um, how does other Africans feel? And maybe it's different in different continents. I would love to hear, you know, what people have in the comments to say about it. But I always wondered, like, what do people think of us? You know, our history is different. Um, I remember asking a guy at the Animal Preserve, like, what do you think of, you know, African-Americans that come back here? I know our history is different, but do you think that this is something that they would um, see as a negative? You know, what do you think? And their answer was so beautiful. He was like, we see it. We, we are so happy for you yeah. to come back to the continent of Africa and see like, this is your home. Like this is a place where you are, you know, you're a part of this, this, this place and you should welcome it. And it just made me feel so loved, you know? And just, I don't know, I, it, it was emotional. I would say it was emotional. So what was, let's go back a little bit. When you got off the plane, obviously it was pitch black. It was very, very much nighttime. So we drove, uh, we got picked up by the driver. We. We got taken to the resort, go to our cottage. So we didn't really, like, see anything, right? No. So the first time, like, there was light was when we woke up in the morning at an animal wildlife preserve where we woke up to, like, giraffes outside of our window. Oh, my gosh, And I was y'all. like, I know this isn't, like, standard issue, like, what the but experience is for most people. But of, it shows it the beauty amazing. of it. It shows the beauty of it. I remember I saw uh, somebody comment when we posted that video of, like, can you talk about the stereotypes of Africa versus, like, what you've seen? And I think sometimes there's so much negative that we don't, that yeah, too. like, we don't see the beauty of Africa. And I'm like, that was literally so picturesque. It was so picturesque. Like, the the sunrise was beautiful and watching in the beauty of the trees and just that moment was just so like I had to really try to take it in mm -hmm. because I felt like I'm, I don't know if I'll ever see this again. I, I felt like this is out of a movie. I mean, it, it felt more than out of a movie. It felt like yeah magical. It just did. I remember the last night we were there and I was just uh, kind of taking a moment to myself like, the guys were like trying to rush us along, like, okay, let's go oh to the next thing. Yeah. I was like, chill. I'm trying to soak this moment in because I don't know if they're just used to Americans that just want to get pictures and then leave. I was like, I'm not that type of American, no. bro. No. Give me get my picture. I appreciate uh, the picture. This place was absolutely beautiful, but they are very big on like content because they have grown their uh presence through social media. And as much as we love the pictures and stuff like that, there was a level where we were like, okay, we just want to enjoy the moment, be uh, present. I'm looking out at this gorgeous landscape of just these like rolling hills with these trees that are obviously very different trees than we see in America. So it's like brand new type of landscape. And you just see the animals kind of just doing their thing. And it was just like, this isn't real. My favorite video is watching the sunset mm -hmm. and seeing that giraffe just walk yeah. past. And I was like, this looks like I'm in a movie. It, it, like I'm in a movie. This is the beginning of a cinematic masterpiece. <laughs> I'm telling you, I had one of those moments. It was almost just a very thankful and shocking moment that I was here mm -hmm. because it, you, you, you think that 
I, it's kind of hard to explain. Like you're, these moments that you have, you think that everybody has these moments and they don't. And I was so grateful to have this. I'm eating breakfast and I'm being surrounded by all these animals. Like that is a once in a lifetime thing. I know you don't believe in that. I don't. But because you think we're going to have more. And we are, but I like well, to. It's like we have the choice to come back. We so do. it doesn't have to be once in a lifetime. But I want to feel like it's once in a lifetime I because agree. I want to appreciate it. I want to just feel this moment. Like I may never get it back, but I want to picture it and like just have that moment. It was, it was worth it. Yeah, I, I agree. Cause you're like, I want to be grateful for it. Like it's my last. Question. I was so thankful that I have somebody who is of a different race that wants that wanted to go to Africa hmm. because I feel like to be honest I feel like there's a lot of places that people talk about and people don't talk about Africa as much as the other places as like a go-to destination as like a go-to do y'all think of South Africa as like Africa plus like a different type of Africa. Lex and I had this conversation. We really weren't sure how like other people view it or mm. how Africans view it. Like I feel like South Africa is kind of its own little entity. Same thing as, and I was asking a lot of Tanzanians this. I remember telling you that mm. I was like, how do you feel about the Northern African countries? You know, um, Algeria yeah. and Morocco and Egypt and like those countries. Do you, when you think of Africa, do you, include them in it and the response was really like not really like that and it was just kind of interesting it was very interesting so i look at i'm like, is south africa also like a kind of just like a culturally separated from the yeah. body of africa so i guess when i think of that i think of like people don't i don't hear a lot of people talk about kenya nigeria um tanzania i hear a lot of people talk about ghana maybe not i do hear a lot of people maybe talk not, about i mean maybe not white people I don't know. It's just I don't hear I don't hear it a lot. Yeah. That's why I'm like as much as I hear about all these other places that people talk about. And so it was beautiful to see like the beauty and also share the beauty. So because I think a lot of people have misconceptions of it. Do you feel like you had misconceptions? Do you feel like it lived to be the experience that you figured it would be? I didn't have any expectation. I think I was just happy to go. Like I legit was happy to go and I was excited to see like the beauty of it all. But I'm also glad that we saw like even the other side of compassion and showing the kids and all of that. It was so interesting to be around people. And a lot of people thought that I was Tanzanian, which do I look like I'm Tanzanian? I don't know. You could pass. And with everybody else that you, you could, saw? I think you could pass. Um, I was speaking a little Swahili. You know, I was speaking a little, a little bit. You Mambo. Know. <laughs> yes, I was speaking a little bit, but it was interesting because when we went to see the Compassion Kids and they saw me and a translator literally said that there's people that look like you that don't talk like you. I want to say 30 of them kids looked at me. They were like. They were. Like, <laughs> and I thought it was so interesting because I'm like, I've never been in a place where they've never seen white people before. Yeah, it was, you step off the bus <laughs> and their eyes are like, what are you? Like, it, it was, it was a very, yeah, I'm sure it was a culture shock for them. Like, a, yeah. I, I don't know what to call it, but it was something because the way they ran up, it was like a mixture of running up out of curiosity and excitement, but also like. like it's like you were an alien a little bit. A little bit. Like you were so different than them. Yeah. And. For me, I was so similar. It's almost like they saw me as one. They saw me as one of them, which I didn't feel like I was one of them. But they saw me as one of them. It was just an interesting dynamic. Yeah, it was. I think if you would have asked me like 15 years ago, like what I expected Africa to be versus what it was, did I have culture shocks? A lot of people ask us that. Like, did you have yeah. culture shock? I think my answer would have been very different, but. With, with my family having been there a couple times, I haven't been there. But with my family having gone there and enough people around us and enough media and enough people correcting these stereotypical views of what Africa yeah. is, I think it was really, really what I felt like it would be yeah. and in, in every good way. Like I, I, I didn't have this perception that, and, and I'm just going to be honest, like everyone lives in a hut or everyone is like impoverished because that wasn't the case and that's not the case. And I think it's, it's a negative American stereotype yeah. and that's how 
kind of how we were indoctrinated and educated to think of Africa. Mm-hmm. Like when you, when, when educators and teachers taught about Africa, they never said positive things from like an industrial perspective yeah. or a cityscape or, you know, any of those things. No, it's, it's definitely, I, I think we saw both sides. Yeah. Yeah. I think we saw both, um, both sides and, you know, they have, so many different dynamics of just to name the whole continent of Africa as a whole as this. I think Africa is so dynamic and honestly, outside of our, our brains and what we can understand. That's why I think people correct us when it talks about the continent, because there's so many different dynamics. Africa is huge Mm -hmm. and I'm learning more, even as I'm coming back of understanding the dynamics. I think that's a big cultural misconception too, is that people think Africa's, Africa. Like, yeah. No, Africa is made up of a lot of diversity. <laughs> diversity. Even when we went with compassion and we saw um, the Maasai tribe and seeing the beauty of that, like we don't see the beauty of stuff like that here, you know, mm-hmm. like it was just into every time I saw them, every time I saw anybody, I pretty much told them this is my first time in the continent of Africa <laughs> and having the Maasai tribe just like, become so welcoming to me and just saw it as such an honor for me to what they would say, come back home. It was, it was beautiful. It was so nice. Yeah, it was. We like, to your point, we got a mixture of a lot of the different, you know, areas, a lot of the different socioeconomic mm-hmm. status. Cause we people. did see people in huts. And, and, we saw and people in that huts. That is a very real reality too. Yeah. Like the, the impoverished you know, situation that a lot of people are in is a absolute reality Yeah, that a part of the reason why we were there is to bring and shed awareness, you know, to the situation that a lot of children and families are in because there is, and it's not poverty like how we feel in America. It is extreme poverty. Yeah. And extreme poverty being, I believe, I don't know if the technical definition is, but I've heard it to be like under a dollar a day is what they're making. Yeah. And you think about how these people are living. It, it is extreme. I want to say this because we did come with an organization that is um, what people would consider American based. But what I love about Compassion is that when we went to the um, the schools that they are working on, we didn't see like white people coming to yeah. help the kids in Tanzania. We saw Tanzanian men and women um, that are workers for Compassion to help the kid, the Tanzanian kids. And they have a compassion organization in Tanzania where Tanzania people are working. You know, we didn't see not one like white person that, that was consistently working through compassion. All of them were Tanzanian men and women who have been working under compassion because the goal is to build the community up. I love that because there is that, um, that uh, concept of like white savior and, you know, bringing Americans in, but they're not helping the community. They're just doing their part, their portion. But for us to see like them actually building up a community, that is what I loved. And that is what I I appreciated of being part of the organization. It seems like compassion has taken a lot of time, energy and attention to how to properly and culturally navigate interceding into a tough situation to help someone. Yeah. Because, they've made it very clear to us, like just going in and doing something for someone, you're taking away from the potential economic um, positive impact that could take from local workers doing that thing. Yeah. But then also there could be a dependency created on, if you just come in here and do it all, then they're just like, you're not empowering people. Right. So there's like, there's just different dynamics that they're thinking through, but I also agree about the white savior and, and the perception of that and, building up the culture and all of those things. I think, I think it's really, I think it's a wise approach. But I I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you, there was some comments about us when it came to us doing work um, far away versus doing stuff in our own community. And I wanted to address that. And I wanted to also have you share how you feel about it too. I don't know who you want to go first. You go first? Yeah. Um, I loved what our compassion leader said. Um, we were just having a really organic conversation, and someone else asked him, like, what wisdom 
would you give? He was like 50 or whatever. And he, yeah. like, what wisdom would you give in your age of what you've learned over the years? And he said, I have learned that my opinions on a subject are not as intensely strong as they used to be. I'm learning to just be more open to nuances and differences and like developing an opinion yeah. over time. The reason why I bring that up is because I think how I used to think was everybody needs to do both. Everybody needs to be, you know, invested in the local community as well as the global community. Reasons why in our specific local community, there is absolute need. I don't think you can turn your back on your neighbor who you live next to every day who's in need, right? Yeah. In, conceptually. But I also believe that the level of poverty and deprivation of basic human rights and resources somewhere else are not as bad as home. So mm. I think there needs to be a global outreach. When people don't literally have access to clean water, that's a lot more intense than some of the, the needs here, right? Yeah. So I felt like each person should give a balance to that. What I have probably changed my perspective on is I think both needs need to be met. Mm -hmm. But does every person need to meet both needs? And I don't think that's the case anymore. Yeah. The reason is because I think that God has called up people to answer a need or answer a call in an area that he's called them to and saying, if I call Bob to the global mission and I call Joe to the local mission, then both get satisfied. Both are yeah. getting taken care of. And they're doing it individually. It's not that Bob doesn't care about local or Joe doesn't care about global, yeah. but my his purpose is happening at the same time, just using yeah. different people for different things. So I think my mentality on that has changed. I agree. I think that God will tell you where you need to go. And I think that he has people for the community in your local community. And I think he has people for a global mission. I will say for me personally, I am led by the spirit and Facts. those that do know me know that I have been in our community for years. I've worked in women and children for, um, I worked in nonprofit for women and children for a long, long time. And then before that I worked with, um, kids that needed uh, shelter assistant living. So I did that when I was 16 so when I say that I am led by the spirit, that doesn't mean I consistently stay in local. That means that that's where God wanted me for that time. And then if he wants me to do something else, I was literally before I was about to get engaged to Brian, I was signed up to become a missionary. <laughs> I this was going to join the Peace Corps. She was going to go to the Peace Corps if we weren't together. But I'm like, I didn't say if we weren't mm. together. I said that I have to live my life, so I'm going to apply like a for the soft Peace Corps. Ultimatum. It was not an ultimatum. Like maybe like six months before. I, I was pose. continuously living my life. I can't hold my hold my life. She said, "I'm not stopping for you." You know what? That's what's what tying me here? I'm like, it, no, Lord. We'll we'll tell that story Help later. Her. But Jesus. I truly believe that when you have a heart for people you may not be fully invested in like i'm going to continue to do all this stuff for the locals all the time but maybe there's a mission that you have that you can just do personally and you don't always need to share it on on instagram and facebook and social media a lot of people don't know that about me but it's something that's in my heart and so I, we got a lot of questions about that because one we have a platform and two because we did something that was so big and open and open we posted a lot about it yeah just know that we do a lot um privately too that people don't know about whether it's giving whether it's donating whether it's helping whether it's serving um we do a lot privately so addressing addressing those comments and i always and i always feel like we could do more so it's not like you know somebody can ask me like oh you feel like you've done enough no i feel like i could do more and i'll be honest I'm not going to open this can of worms, but I'm the type of person that doesn't mind opening it because we maybe should open it at some point. But what's happening in Gaza right now, I feel like is something that when you see war at such a catastrophic level, yeah, like I do feel like it's the responsibility of everyone to get involved in that. Absolutely. I feel like when genocides were happening in Rwanda, like... Mm -hmm. that's something that everyone should be aware of and being involved in pushing and fighting against. Yeah. And, and in Africa, there's a lot, there's so much going on. 
there's so much going on. And I feel like the problem is, is picking which thing to care about and how to care about it and how to live your life. And Brian has seen me like I've struggled with uh, what's going on in Gaza, what's, what's going on in Africa, what's been going on all across the world. And you don't know what to do. And you kind of are in this stance of like, God, what are you doing? And when I say involved, I don't mean you need to go over there and start helping people personally. I'm not even necessarily saying you have to donate money. I think we should be praying about it. Minimum. I, I think we should be praying about it as a community. <laughs> like, yes. Just to be honest, like that that needs to be the bare minimum. When you look at Travis, he's like that. Ukraine happened. Like, yes. You, you have to respond at least in prayer. And also tell our platforms to pray as well. And that's what we do. It's not just about like, okay, we're going to pray privately, but we use our platform to share like, hey, you know, if we know that it's going on, hey, send out a prayer to other countries, send out a prayer to different continents, um, different leaders. Um, situation happened here where we're like, we need to pray for our country, we need to pray for our leaders. Yeah. I think um, there's like a phase that everything goes through where it's trendy to talk about. T trendy to talk about Ukraine, trendy to talk about Gaza. Yeah. And then there's a point where it's been happening long enough that people are like, like the trendiness fades all away. And I think, and I, I, I'm not even going to hold you up. Like I struggle with that too sometimes. Like just remembering that this is still happening. Yeah. And, and keeping it top of mind. So I, I don't point fingers at anyone. I, I just think we all should be doing as good a job as we can to keep these things top of mind. Absolutely. To remember that people are still struggling abroad in some very serious ways. Um, even, even you think about topics that maybe aren't talked about enough, like Christians in China. Like, this is a real thing. Persecution of Christians in China and having the underground church there, that is a very real, yeah. everyday struggle for people who are dying for the faith overseas that are we thinking about enough? And I yeah. say to myself, I'm not. I don't think about it enough. I don't pray enough for those things. I yeah. need to do better at that. Absolutely. So I think we all need to have a charge to ourselves to do better with this. And I also think that we need to, I, I feel that going outside your day-to-day -day living is huge. Yeah. Part of the reason why I wanted to go to, I wanted to do compassion was because I needed to get out of my day-to-day -day life to see and and really open my eyes on what is happening in the world. Yes, you can feel it from a level of reading the news, getting on social media, mm -hmm. but being in the midst of that is keeping your heart open. I feel like it softens your heart. One of the things that I struggle with, and I'm, I'm aware that I struggle with it, is if it's not in front of my face, sometimes I don't think about it. Yeah. And a lot of times it's not a matter of heart posture because... If I if someone just tells me something, sometimes I can just like keep going about my day and I don't stop to like take a moment and really empathize and think through what they're going through and how does this impact them and this and that. The moment that person gets in front of my face and tells me that same story, I'm all in. I'm here. Yeah. I'm here with you. I'm experiencing with you. I'm praying with you. I'm I'm invested. Now my heart's invested and now I care about now I'm following up. And for me, sometimes it takes getting there in person. Yeah. I don't like that it takes me getting there in person. I think even, yeah. even for this trip, going there and being a part, once I'm there, I'm like, I'm immersed in this thing. Now it's all I'm thinking about. I'm thinking yeah. about the people back in Tanzania that yeah. we met and like what's going on and how can we do more. But like I wish it didn't take that for me sometimes. I'm like, what? And I ask myself, like, why can't I empathize at a greater level where all you have to do is tell me about a situation and I'm like, I put myself there. And I think it's something I'm working on. I really, I really see it as a gap where I, I need think to get this is. At. I think it's such human nature, especially because we get so much information so fast, and we're on the go. We have to move. We we have our cadence of life, and getting out of your cadence of life helps in so many ways. Yeah. And I think compassion did that for us, where we were able to go and see somebody else's life. That's and literally point. spend somebody and spend time with somebody else and not worry about our day-to-day -day life. And we were able to care about other people's lives more. That's a great point of like actively and intentionally putting yourself in situations that just get you out of your yes. norm, out of your That's exactly rhythm. why I really wanted to do it. I love that. Because I feel like if I want, I want 
if if we want to believe in community, if we want to believe in helping others, we need to put ourselves in situations where we can see other people. Mm -hmm. We can't see other people in our day to day lives. Yeah. I know we didn't talk a lot about compassion as far as I think how much that part was life changing as much as Mount Kilimanjaro. But I think this is something that has spurred a lot of. I don't know, a lot of energy towards us caring about people outside ourselves more. And I want to continue to do that. I really hope they invite us to another mm -hmm. uh, trip next year. Y'all hear that, Compassion? I know. I really hope so. Not Mount <laughs> Kilimanjaro. No, thank you. But, but another one. But what also helped that happen is if we continue to push the message to y'all that we still, after all said and done, we want to sponsor more children. Yes. We want to help keep this message going in our channel. Absolutely. So you will see us every so often just pop up and say, hey, y'all, reminder, can we sponsor some more children in need over here? We're going to put the link in the description now. If you are interested in just being a part of change, we saw it, you guys. We saw how much this changed a family. These, these They changed so many children that are in need. And we are personally going to just, we want to start more of an initiative with their Women and Children Survivor Center. So we're going to put more information about that. But we are encouraging everybody to get connected with Compassion. It is it is a good organization all around. Yeah. Um, but we appreciate you guys listening to us just kind of talk about our experience with Africa, my personal experience. And let us know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to follow at underscore the co-life underscore on Instagram, at underscore the Let's Get Deep pod on Instagram, TikTok the co-life, YouTube the co-life. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we will see you next time podcast she does that so flawlessly i <laughs> love y'all love y'all